All right, welcome everyone to today's functional group update for the platform backend team. Uh, my name is Dao Man, and I'm the engineering manager for this team. And today I'd like to run you through what we've been working on the last five weeks and what we plan to get done in the next five. Uh, and as always with functional group updates, um, it's all about the questions you guys have to ask. I'm sure you've already reviewed the slides. If you haven't yet, they are in the chat. Uh, a link to them is in the chat. So if there's anything you'd like to, you know, get some clarification on, that's what we can spend this uh, these following 30 minutes on, or less, if there's nothing. Um, so in the last five weeks, first of all, we finalized development of GitLab 10.5 on the 7th, and then we started um, development of GitLab 10.6 on the 8th. I'm going to talk about GitLab 10.6 a little bit more in the next slide, but I'd like to quickly recap at 10.5 and specifically what the platform backend team contributed to this. Of course, there's a lot in that release, both platform stuff and, and stuff other teams worked on, but here are five issues that I'd like to specifically call out, uh, and I'd like to thank those people for working on those. First of all, Git LFS2 file locking support. Uh, of course, GitLab has supported Git LFS for a while, but Git LFS2 added file locking support where you can lock access to a specific file on the command line. Uh, GitLab already supported file locking uh, as kind of our own solution in the web interface. Uh, and now we also support Git LFS2 file locking and it interacts as you would expect with our own web interface based file locking. If you lock a file on the command line using Git LFS, it will also be locked in the interface and the other way around. Uh, so thanks Ruben who uh, works on that for 10.5. And then the next one, push to create a new project. This is a feature that I am probably unreasonably excited about, but it's just really cool. If you're starting a new project locally and you have your whole Git set up and you have your first couple of commits, uh, before now, if you wanted to you know, make that into an actual GitLab project, you wanted to share it with people, you'd need to context switch between your terminal and the browser, and you need to, you know, follow the flow there to create that project. And now you can do that by just pushing to a non-existent project URL. Um, if you're pushing to an existing namespace, so that's your own personal namespace or a group that you're a master or an owner of, uh, if you're pushing into that, we will automatically create the project for you as a private project, so you don't accidentally leak any data. And then, of course, you can always go into the web interface and switch it to public, but it, um, it's private by default, and this can definitely save some time if you just want to get your little project up onto GitLab instead of it uh, being on your local machine. Thanks, Tiago, who worked on that. Um, we also added proper LFS support when uploading a file through the web interface. Of course, we've supported LFS for a while. I just uh, mentioned that, but there was a bug that had been around for a while, which was that if you upload a file through the web interface, uh, it would be added in the repo as, as a concrete file, no matter how big it was and no matter what the LFS policy said about certain file extensions needing to be in LFS rather than write in the repo. Uh, for them, in front 10.5, we fixed this. So thank you, James Edward Jones, who worked on that. Um, we also added the ability to transfer a single group to another group. Like I mentioned in the last FGU, this is something that Myra actually worked on in her as part of her application to GitLab when she uh, was trying to join the company, uh, which you know of course she did, and she finished this issue that she had worked on back then, um, which means that subgroups just became a little bit more powerful because now you can actually easily move to a subgroup-based hierarchy from a simple um, single-layer hierarchy you might have had before by transferring one group into another level in that hierarchy. Uh, we also fix, fixed a number of bugs and security issues that I uh, explicitly like to uh, point out just because uh, it's 11 out of the 23 issues we put in 10.5. Uh, and I think a 50-50 ratio of features to bugs and security fixes is, uh, is, is worth mentioning. If you want to read about all of the other stuff that went into those um, into 10.5, you can follow the little link to more. If you are a community member who's viewing that link, you might see a lower count than what I just called out because some of these issues are still confidential, which means that only GitLab team members can view them. Uh, but this should also change over the next couple of days as these issues are, are opened up. That's the last five weeks. If you have any questions, feel free to post them. Uh, Tone says he was surprised to see the LFS file locking messages on pushing. Nice work. Um, I think that message, I don't know if it's file locking. Oh yeah, right. Someone locked a file in GitLab CE at some point. Uh, and then we had to unlock it. Anyway, that's uh, that's that's all good. No, actually, it's it, like when you push um, LFS objects, then um, you can configure Git to also do the LFS file locking, and you have to configure Git correctly to make that work with GitLab as a whole. Oh, oh okay, you can do that automatically with Git LFS. I was not even aware of that. Uh, but thanks, Tone. Uh, at least I'm happy that you find it nice work, even though I wasn't aware of the specific thing you were calling out as having been added. Um, 
anyway, in the next five weeks, first of all, we plan to finalize development of GitLab 10.6 on the 7th and release on the 22nd. And there's going to be a lot of stuff in this contributed by platform. Uh, the first two here are things we already worked on for 10.5, and they were very close to done for 10.5. But because they have pretty big security implications, we wanted to give them a little bit more time to you know, be super, super confident about them not accidentally opening up any holes and, and us having to like scramble to patch those in 10.5 patch releases. So we decided to push, push both at 10.6 uh, and both of them are, you know, one of them is already merged and the other one is going to get merged soon. So 10.6 will bring both of those features. The third one is a new feature, or at least it's not a new feature, but it's a feature that we are newly developing for 10.6, which is allow uh, the modification of a fork merge request branch by project maintainers. What this means is that if you were submitting a merge request from a fork to uh, an upstream project or for, from a fork of GitLab CE to the actual GitLab CE repo, um, the creator of that merge request will now be able to say that maintainers or, or project members of the canonical repository GitLab orgs that GitLab CE are able to make small changes or you know, add changes of any size inside the source branch of that merge request, which means that if they want to fix a simple typo or for example, they want to retry a filled pipeline or they want to you know, fix the RuboCop issue because they saw that there was some, some, some code style issue, uh, they can fix it themselves pretty quickly rather than instead of having to go to that person, wait for them to make that change, which add, can add hours or days to the whole review cycle. So this will definitely save some time and that's going to go into 10.6. We're also adding group and project badges. Uh, these are Badges like the ones for CI status, code quality, um, those kind of things, little badges that you often see in project readmes. We are making these kind of a first class citizen on the project homepage. So you will see these by the project title on the product description, uh, you will see a little list of these badges. And these can be configured on both the project level and the group level. And if you configure one at the group level, it will automatically be visible on any project inside that group. Um, and of course, these will be configured with a URL with some, some placeholders for certain parameters, like the actual project name, uh, the, the latest branch, the commit shell of the latest branch, et cetera, so that the external system that we are calling out to, to get that little image uh, will be able to uh, load the, la the, the latest data and, and present that to us. Um, next, we are adding API endpoints for importing and exporting projects. Uh, importing and exporting projects, these are features that we've supported for a while through the web interface if you went into the admin or the settings area of your project. Um, and now we are adding APIs to the exact same thing. So you'll be able to export a project, which gives you a TGC file, and then you can upload that same project TGC file through the API to create a new project off of it. And of course, the idea is that this would happen on two different GitLab instances. So this means that you can automate automatically moving a project from one instance to the other um, as kind of an alternative to mirroring if for whatever reason you are not able to uh, have this direct connection between the two servers, having them talk to each other directly. You can export on one side and import on the other uh, through some side channel of, you know, it doesn't really matter to us how the data gets from A to B, but this will solve that uh, particular use case. We are also going to add CI CD for external projects. This means that you will be able to create a project inside GitLab that has all the features disabled except for continuous integration and continuous uh, deployment, the CI CD pipeline features, and it will automatically update itself based on an external repo, like on GitHub or Bit bucket or another GitLab instances for some reason you'd like to set it up that way. And this has a couple of sub issues. Uh, specifically, um, we are going to automatically trigger a GitLab mirror update when GitHub receives a push. Right now, if you set up a GitLab project to be a mirror, that means that it will on a schedule automatically pull new data from, from the remote side. Um, but this will be on a schedule, which means that it's not quite real time, depending, of course, on when inside that schedule period the push happens on the GitHub side of things or, or the side of things on the other server. Uh, of course, GitHub supports webhooks as well. So we will automatically set up a Git webhook on GitHub, which will tell GitLab, hey, I just got an update, which will immediately uh, trigger that GitLab pool mirroring update. The other one is also really interesting, GitLab CI CD status inside GitHub projects. This means that if GitLab CI CD pipelines run and they fail or they succeed or they have a warning or they do anything of the, of, uh, of the things that pipelines can do, we will automatically update the GitHub project on the other side with that little status information about the commit. So this will be displayed inside GitHub pull requests, inside um, you know, the GitHub, anywhere where they show these commit statuses. So that means that you can use GitLab CI and GitHub um, in, in, in combination if you, for whatever reason, want to stay with GitHub for certain features, but you really want to make use of those awesome features that GitLab CI CD has. And the third one the platform is working on, which is a sub-issue of the CI CD stuff, is the option to overwrite diverge benches when pull mirroring. Right now, if you if you set up a project on GitLab to be a pool mirror of some external project, uh, if you then make a change in one of the branches on the GitLab side of things, just add a commit or you rewrite something, we will not automatically update that branch with new data on the remote 
side of things because we don't want to accidentally delete the data that you you know the commits that you might have added locally uh, because we don't want you to lose that data but we will add an option to to toggle between the overwrite behavior and the ignore behavior which is the current uh, only currently the only option and which is still going to be the default but of course if we're doing ci cd for external projects you automatically want to mirror every branch that is changed on the remote side of things uh, and you want to pull in all the changes even if the local branch diverged um, of course there's a lot more that we are doing for 10.6 and if you follow that little link you'll be able to find the list of deliverables for 10.6 for platform. And if you follow the development link at the very top, you'll also see our issue board. So you can follow along right with the team, uh, you know, how we are progressing issues from backlog yet to be picked up all the way to close. And you can kind of see where we are at um, this far into the month. Uh, and then on March 8th, we are going to kick off development of GitLab 10.7. And if you'd like to know what's going to be in that release, um, I recommend you join the public kickoff on that 8th of March, uh, which is open to the public as always. Uh, like I mentioned last couple of times, I actually don't know quite what's going to go into 10.7 yet. We um, will try to finalize that uh, over the next uh, two weeks or so. All right, looks like some questions showed up in the chat. Brandon O'Leary asks, when 10.6 is released and group level SAML does that mean it will immediately be available on GitLab.com for customers, or are there any additional steps after that? Um, it will be part of a specific GitLab.com plan. Uh, I'm not completely sure which some of the product to be able to clarify that. But then once the feature is released, people will be able to link, link their GitLab that will come group to a SAML server, and they'll be able to use it to sign in. Um, but we have we're kind of, as, as we always do at GitLab, we split up the whole GitLab to come SAML thing into multiple stages. So the whole feature won't look and feel complete until one or two releases into the future. But with 10.6, it will at least be able to link your account up and to sign in using SAML, which is kind of the first uh, iteration. If you want to see the details about what we're bringing today and what's going to be in 10.7 or 10.8, um, you can follow the link to that issue and we'll describe that in more detail. Lyle asked about a few current customers interested in the answer to this. Uh, well, yeah, there's your answer. And if anything's still unclear, um, also feel free to go into that issue and ask me or any of the product people or the developer working on it uh, what the deal is and exactly what you can expect in the first release. Oh, okay, it will actually be limited behind the cookie in 10.6. Well, there you go. Uh, I'm working with outdated information, but I'm glad that James was able to uh, clarify that. Remy says badges are cool, and Philippe says this is going to be used to migrate gymnasium users. Yeah, that's talking about the CI CD for external project stuff. Uh, gymnasium users who are still who are using gymnasium with their GitHub account currently uh, will be able to migrate using GitHub with GitLab CI CD, and then inside GitLab CI CD, gymnasium um, will be running effectively, which means that those people can stay in GitHub, and uh, and we can slowly start to convince them to come over to GitLab with uh, all of the other features that we have to offer. Um, okay, if there's nothing else, then I'd like to thank you all for your time and you get about 20 or 17 more minutes of your days left. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.